Hello, my name is John Stoltz, Director of Customer Experience for the Association for Supply Chain Management, and I'll be your host for today's webinar, Blockchain in the Supply Chain. I'm pleased to be joined by Eric Peters, President and CEO of Procurant, the first global blockchain-enabled fresh food supply chain platform. Eric brings extensive experience and vision in supply chain technology to a series of successful software companies he has founded and led. He's also served as a board advisor to several startups in Silicon Valley, and has been featured and quoted in numerous articles on supply chain in retail and the food industry, and is a contributing author to five books on supply chain issues. We're excited to share that Eric will be joining us for ASCM 2019 in Las Vegas with an all new session on how blockchain will transform the food supply chain. The ASCM annual conference features exceptional content covering all areas of the value chain, which makes it the perfect destination for all supply chain professionals. Early bird pricing registration runs through June 30th, so please take advantage of savings of up to $600 and register today. Learn more at ASEMconference.org. It is now my pleasure to present Eric Peters. Thanks, John. Uh, and uh, it's a pleasure to be here today and, and talk about blockchain. Uh, the presentation we're going to go through today really talks about blockchain in the supply chain, and it's a kind of a culmination of probably the couple thousand people I've presented to over the last 12 months on the subject. And, and I've learned three things. I've learned people want to know, what is blockchain? I want to know, where do I use it? They want to know, what issues should I be aware of? And then once they understand those three things, they like to know, uh, what the uh, you know what are some use cases and some um, uh, examples of, of the technology and so that's what we're going to kind of cover today we're going to talk about these uh, subjects and then uh, at the conference I'll go into more specific examples around what people are doing what are some of the use cases and how are we using blockchain in, in specifically the food supply chain so what I've, I've learned in giving these presentations is, is when I talk to engineers and supply chain people, they're validation people. They want to understand why something works, and they want to be able to understand how do you validate the information. And so what I found out is there's basically a knowledge gap that exists on what is blockchain. And I, and I think it comes from a couple of things. You know, the, the word blockchain has some negative connotations in the marketplace. Uh, you know, you read about Bitcoin, it's up, it's down, it's back up again. The swings in it are so wild. Every banker tells you it's a fraud. Uh, governments uh, don't want you to buy cryptocurrency. So it creates a lot of negative energy in, in the marketplace right now around blockchain. It, it makes people feel like it's, it's at the top of the hype cycle. And on the other hand, what you have are the, I'll call it the, the, the tech behemoths in the corporate world. And they're pitching this, they're praising this, they're calling it the next big thing. And the fact is, what blockchain is, is it's going to be a technology that over the next 10, 15 years is going to transform different industries. And, and I try to describe to people, what's, what, what is it simply? I think of it as a secure global computer system in the cloud. I think of it a place where your database is in the cloud, where you're going to share that data. And, you know, and, and the thing about data is, Data is only as good as your trust in the data uh, and the validity of that data. And so what we have is we have a shared database where it cannot be changed, it can't be deleted, no one controls, and, and, and it's, it's a decentralized ledger. Second part of it is if you're going to have this database in the sky, then no organization really should control it. No one, if one party controls the data, the other participants are going to be leery of putting data into that system. So it needs to be ruled by a governance model that's embedded in the system. And then finally, you know, if you think of a computer system in the sky, what's a computer system in the sky? Well, it's a database and it's stored procedures or routines that let you do something with that data. And so what blockchain is is a combination of, of those three things. And the th thing I like to tell people, because they will say, Eric, why is, this, why is this so transformative? Why are people saying it's going to change so many things? Just like this transition from 
uh, proprietary from perpetual software to the cloud has occurred over the next last 10 years. That was the first step of this evolution of everything being on the internet. The block, blockchain and, and associated technologies will be the next transitional phase. So let's start with just a basic question. Like I said, engineers and supply chain people, they want to know what what is a block? And you know, if you think about it, what is a block? Think of it as a container that's going to hold a certain amount of data. And so I'm going to start with something from my industry, and I'm going to look at temperature data. So I've collected some temperature data. I'm going to take that temperature data. I'm going to dump that into a block. And once that block gets to a certain size, I'm then going to generate what's called a hash. And people have probably heard that phrase out there, this cryptographic hash. Well, what, what, what really is a hash? A hash is simply, it's a, it's a, think of it as a long string of numbers and letters that represent something that's coded. And so if I look at the first hash, the first hash says, go Penn State, my alumni. If I look at the second hash, it says, go Penn State. Same thing, except that Penn State is not capitalized. Now, when you look at those two hashes, it is impossible to look at hash one and say it's related to hash two. Absolutely impossible. The thing about this is I went on the internet and I just Googled MD5 and I hash generator and I did this on the internet. And what we find out is, the first thing we find out is with a hash, it's, it's very easy to calculate. These formulas are very easy to generate a hash. The thing is, once you have the hash, it's extremely difficult to calculate the text from the hash. So it's easy to create the hash. It's hard to take that hash and figure out what did I really mean. What that means is that when you put that data in that block and you create that hash for that data, no one is going to be able to tamper with that data. So now, you know, the question is, and, and, and you hear on the Internet, and you hear this huge industry is created around miners. What, what, what do we need miners for? Well, that's a good question. The reason we need miners is if all we were doing is putting data into a block, then that's just storing data in a, a cryptographic manner. There's, there's nothing special about that at all. The beauty of all of this, and, 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 and where this goes back to when, when the original paper on Bitcoin was written, was how to create these blocks of data and link these blocks of data in such a way that they were, the data would be immutable and you would not be able to crack the code. So what I have here on the screen is really the, the, probably the, one of the simplest examples of, of what blockchain really is. So if I take block one, I've got my temperature data that I put in from my food supply chain. And temperature data is data that we don't want people to tamper with. We, we, we have to trust the data. And it, and it passes the test that I call it's data that really is not competitive in any way. It, it doesn't give you an advantage in your supply chain if, if uh, uh, the temperature is 42 degrees. You, you, what you are doing is you are writing down an actual environmental calculation at that time. So I've got block one. Now, what I do is, what I, what I do is if I add block one to block two, I create a hash. That, that's pretty simple. The complexity of blockchain is, is that I take block one, I add what is called a nonce, and nonce is, this is a math term I didn't know until I started studying this. Um, a nonce actually stands for number used once, uh, and it's an actual mathematical term. And so what I have here is actually, I'm, I'm, I'm showing you a, a, a Bitcoin example, but when you take block one and you add it to block two, you create a cryptographic hash. Now, in the Bitcoin world, and in every uh, type of standards, you're going to have a, a, a different calculation criterion. But in Bitcoin, what you have to do is create a hash that has nine zeros to start with it. So if I take block one and I add it to, and I multiply it by block two, or I put it in my generator, I'm going to come up with a hash. I have no guarantee that that hash starts with nine zeros. So what I do is I throw a number in called a nonce. And what a nonce times block one times block two equals is an answer. If that answer doesn't start with nine zeros, I change the knowns. If that doesn't answer start with a zero, I change the knowns. So what actually happens here is you have people with large computer systems that are doing these calculations. They're called the miners. 
And what they're doing is they're trying to calculate as often as they can. So you imagine it's a large system and they're changing the notes uh, thousands and thousands of times a millisecond to get to that answer. Because the first guy that gets the answer gets paid in a cryptocurrency in that particular blockchain environment. Now, when you do this, what you're doing is you're, you're coming up with an answer that starts with nine zeros. The beauty of all of this in blockchain is once I know the notes, every computer in the system can then validate this calculation. So the hard part is coming up with that unique number that when you put block one and block two together, creates a unique hash. And once you know the answer, everybody can validate it. Once 51% of the computers on a network validate it, it is the answer. The chain is linked and you go to collecting data for the next thing. What that means is I think, and hopefully what you can understand from that, that particular picture is, once something is in a blockchain, it is totally secure. And, and, I, and I, I go through this, I spend five minutes on this, and I do this example and every, time I, every time I make a presentation, because engineers want to know how things work. Supply chain people want to know how things work. I mean, the big, and if we go to the next slide, the biggest impediment to supply chain is trust and the sharing of accurate information. From, from my 30 plus 40, I don't know how long I've been in supply chain, for forever I've been in supply chain, this has been a problem. We don't trust the other party. We don't necessarily want transparency in what we share. And so what we have is we have this amplification of bad data that occurs through the supply chain. Uh, how Lee at Stanford called it the bull of effect. And, and that's because of lack of accurate information and lack of trust. So getting the blockchain. Why is blockchain so important for our supply chain people? It's irrefutable. It's immutable. It's shareable record of information. This is what we've been trying to do in supply chain from the start of time to be able to do that. And so blockchain is really kind of... <clears throat> if you will, thought of as a technology that can finally enable that. Now, that's great. So now I've got this data that's in a, a blockchain. I, you know, in, in some ways, I have, a, I have people ask me at conferences all the time, well, Eric, isn't that just a database? That's a shared database. Well, yeah, it is a shared database. And, and, and the system is more than just a shared database. When I think about blockchain in the supply chain, I think about all the parts that exist in this type of new environment. Because what we're talking about is really an ecosystem of technologies that are going to change the supply chain. Um, so what that led to was, okay, well, so I got this data and, and uh, the question started to come up with, well, if it's a computer, it's in the sky, we need to be able to run programs, we need a smart contract. And you've heard the word smart contract, and I can, I can say universally. Um, now, if, if you're watching this webcast and you attend my presentation, please don't raise your hand, because when I ask this question, nobody raises their hand. Nobody is confident enough to say to me, what is a smart contract? And in fact, I didn't understand what a smart contract was until I actually did a lot of research and found out, that if you see on the slide there, you'll see a guy named Nick Sabo. He actually wrote about smart contracts in 1995. And here's what he wrote about. So he wrote about a, a soda machine. And, and his original definition was that you got this soda machine. It's this, this physical device. Uh, and, and, and there's kind of an applied contract. That is, if I put $2 in, sodas, now that's today, because you can see here I've got an old picture of a Pepsi machine from, I think it's around Nick's time in 1995, maybe. Uh, but so in today's world, right, it's more expensive. So I, I, I put in $2 and Soda comes out. If you don't put $2, soda doesn't come out. That's kind of the implied smart contract with this machine. If you don't put $2 in and soda still comes out, well, that's bad. The, the contract's not working. So what the vending machine is, it has encoded this set of rules that keeps it kind of somewhat secure, you know, as, as secure as you need for soda bottles, to make sure that when these conditions are met, this will occur. And what Nick surmised is eventually over the internet, this is how the internet would work. So let's go to my industry. Let's talk about agriculture for a minute. And I'll give you one example here. Um, but what is an example of a smart contract? Well, in agriculture, 
Uh, in fact, it, it's so timely. I, this is, uh, uh, the, I think, we're the week before Memorial Day here in California, and we had weird rains this week. And what has happened, I read in the news yesterday, strawberry crops are being affected right now. And, and, and we are going to have a increase in strawberry prices. There's been strawberries and blueberries that were damaged as we're getting near harvest. And the harvest, uh, we've lost days of harvest right now because of the rain. Well, that's why farmers buy contracts. So a farmer buys, let's just say, crop insurance. And his crop insurance has several conditions. And you, you, you know, you can buy insurance for anything out there today. And so what I'm doing is I'm saying, okay, I'm going to buy this insurance. If the temperatures, there's a number of days where it's above a certain temperature that could trigger insurance. Consecutive days ab above a consecutive, a certain temperature. So let's say it's not just that it's over 100 degrees 10 days in the growing cycle, but if it's over 100 degrees five days in a row. Or if I have rainfall, like I just had here in California uh, during uh, strawberry season. Or if I had some natural disaster, hail, wind, whatever it might be. So I've got, I, I buy insurance and I've got these conditions. And these insurance guys, they're pretty smart guys. They've got these tables that figure out how they're going to make money on this thing. Um, so I'm a farmer and I go and I'm going to go file my claim. I write my claim up. I send it to the insurance company. The first thing the insurance company says is, give me proof. So I'm a farmer. I don't necessarily have the most digital records. And now I've got to figure out, okay, now i got to go back and i got to prove all this stuff. i got to put this claim together to get paid. Many times the farmer doesn't even go to that problem. Or if we've ever had a challenge with an insurance company, we're going to be asked for proof. We're going, we're going to be challenged. Well, in the world of blockchain and smart contracts, the smart contract would automatically pay this farmer his claim when all the conditions of the smart contract were met in the system. And so what we have is we've got the temperature data that's in a blockchain. We've got rainfall information that's in a blockchain. We have this data that's immutable that was recorded, and immediately the farmer gets paid. Now, you, you sit there and say, well, wait a minute. Don't insurance companies try to pay claims late? No, no. What insurance companies want to do is they would like to have the least amount of labor to pay that claim, the least amount of work. And it, it, it really is just a simple statistical problem on actuary tables about how they're going to make a, a fair return for their money and, and protect themselves. And so this is an example of what a smart contract is. So now let's talk about this. So now, so now, you know, we understand what's blockchain. How do these pieces start to fit together? The question goes up, well, where does it apply? So here's what I tell people about blockchain, because you hear so much out there. Blockchain is going to do this. It's going to do that. It's going to save this, save that. If it's data that must be trusted, if it's data that cannot be tampered with, that's where blockchain applies. So I, I, I've given you seven examples here of, of where blockchain applies. But you, you get on the list here, property records. I mean, think about title insurance. That is an industry that will eventually disappear, right? Property records cannot ha have got to be immutable. I remember I was over in uh, the Czech Republic in uh, a couple of years ago, and we went to the original building that holds the property records. And they have books from the 1500s. They have original deeds and property records. That is how immutable property records have to be. Medical records, right? You, you don't want a bad medical record. Financial records, it's obvious. Tax records. Now, this is an area for governments, which is of, of real importance, right? They want to make sure that all of the links in the supply chain are being recorded, especially in this global trade world that we have, right? We want to know, especially in our, our world of tariffs today that we have, we want to know where did this come from, what is the supply chain? How do we make sure we get tax collection on that? <clears throat> Voting. Well, voter fraud has been talked about since the founding of the United States and probably before that. Um, how do we make sure that the voting, and, you know, and, and as we talk about doing voting online and those types of things, how do we make sure that we can trust that? And then the last two really get to the, the, the supply chain. <clears throat> Quality assurance and supply chain management. And the thing I want to be careful about here is just because they're listed on this page of where blockchain applies doesn't mean they apply everywhere. So we're going to the next, the next page. Blockchain and the supply chain. Here's how I see kind of the landscape of, of how this works. You've got three components that this new technology platform is going to bring. And we, we're not going to talk much about IoT today. But, you know, the question comes up, well, 
you know, if I'm going to put this in a, a, this vault, this data in this vault, how do I know the data is accurate that's going into that vault? And so IoT is going to, in the Internet of Things is going to prove to be the eyes, if you will, of the, of the technology. Blockchain is going to be the books. That's going to be the information is stored. And eventually, pay-to-pay -pay or cryptocurrency systems will be the movement of money. And, and when I say that, I'm not talking about Bitcoin or Ethereum or NEO or any of these things. What I'm talking about when I talk about payments is banks and governments are going to use this technology to, to move funds. The amount of money, the trillions of dollars that move each day, will be done eventually in some digital type of thing. But at the bottom, the two biggest causes of supply chain inefficiencies are we don't trust information or it's bad or it's missing. So now... If that's how blockchain is, is used in the supply chain, you know, I said the second question engineers and supply chain people ask me about are, are, are concerns. And the first concern I get asked about is, what about data accuracy? And, and this goes to the old adage, you know, they used to talk about in the early days of the internet, did you know there was a dog on the other side chatting with you or it was a person, right? And so data accuracy, I break that up into really kind of three things. I, I, I look at data accuracy as, okay, is a human putting the information in the system? If a human is putting information in, in the system, then the question is, is it 100% accurate? The answer is no, it doesn't have to be 100% accurate. It's what the person puts in it. Second level is, okay, so somebody scans a barcode, a PDF code, some, a QR code does that. That's, that's a higher level of accuracy, but there's still a human intervention in that. And the third area, which is where this all kind of starts to, to fit together, is if it's an Internet of Things, an IoT device that records that. And we can just about guarantee with an IoT device, with the use of software self-checking, that it's 100% accurate 100% of the time, except for that one time it fails. And at that point when it fails, we stop recording information from that IoT device. But that is, that's question number one that, that, that folks ask. And there are two answers to it. One is the methodology to get the information in has to be as accurate as possible. It's only as accurate as your trust in how the process was to put the data in. But the second thing, which I talk to a lot of companies about to tell me, well, Eric, we started a blockchain project and we've had to pull back on it. Why? Because our own data is not good. Our ASNs aren't accurate. Our purchase orders aren't accurate. Our invoices aren't accurate. So we can't write inaccurate data to the blockchain. Otherwise, we're just basically wasting our time. So that's that's the, 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 the first question that supply chain people and engineers ask me. The second one, which I get asked almost universally, is, okay, so what about my data? I understand all this stuff about the technology, but I don't want everybody to see it. Enterprise, so everything I've talked about today so far is about public blockchains. Uh, and, and, and that's where blockchain technology came up. Enterprises entered the equation and said, well, yeah, but I don't, I don't want everybody to see my data. Um, you know, if, if you're a large retailer and you're putting your ASN data on a public blockchain, people will pretty soon figure out who you are. I don't want everyone on my network. I don't want on everyone on the network. I don't want to be hacked. I don't want inaccurate information in my system. There's a lot of concerns that enterprises have spent 30, 40 years with, with ERP systems trying to get this data right. And so what enterprise concerns came up to was we need to now look at public versus private blockchains. And that's what we've done. We've come up with the idea of, well, maybe there's a thing called a private blockchain. And today organizations like Linux uh, are, are, are managing standards for private blockchains. But what private blockchain is, it's, it's, you know, it's called blockchain. It's really distributed ledger technology, which is very, very, very similar, same concept. Um, but what it is, it's a permissions network. So only people with permission can get on that network. If you want to go out and see the latest Bitcoin transaction, you can go to bitcoin.info and you'll see what the last transaction was on the internet. So this is permission. These keep the, comp the transactions confidential. So you can say who can see what. There's no cryptocurrency required. Now, the participants in the network have to pay to run the network. Um, so it's not a public in that sense. So there's a cost. It's, nothing's free, but there's no cryptocurrency required. And you use smart contracts that are within the context of your private 
blockchain. The thing about smart contracts, which I, I you know, like I said, I tell people, they say, well, how do you guys learn about blockchain and, and procuring? And I tell for every nine mistakes, we get one thing right. I mean, it's a very emerging technology. One of the interesting things we learned is if we write a smart contract to a public blockchain, everybody sees the source code. It's out there. And so you have to think about what do you want to put in a public versus what do you want to put in a private? And that's why some of the private blockchain technology thinking came up for uh, the enterprises. And you know, at the bottom of my list, Hyperledger is an example of a private blockchain. Uh, there are several examples of, of private blockchains out there. But these fall into the context of an enterprise. So now you've got this private blockchain. You've got certain rules of who can see what. Governance becomes the central issue to a blockchain project. So what, what does that mean? Well, you know, now that there are a select group of parties involved, who determines the rules and who determines who plays? And so if I, if I go to the next slide, th this is where I call it technology utopia collides with governance. You know? And this is an example where Maersk and IBM came up with a blockchain solution. It was going to be the containership blockchain solution for the world. And what happens is, well, the, the number two shipping company comes out and says, we're not going to be on that blockchain. We're not going to be on the Maersk blockchain. And what you have is a governance issue where, yeah, it sounds great that everybody in the industry is going to get on this and agree to standards. Uh, and the tech companies are going to, to, to push this out there. And then you get to the reality of the business world. Why? I mean, we haven't trusted ourselves in supply chain for 2,000 years. Why are we all of a sudden going to trust ourselves tomorrow? Because somebody says we're going to use blockchain. Governance becomes one of the largest issues here. Second thing which enterprises have to be careful about is, you know, it, it's, it's funny that, uh, and I'm in technology, but I listen to technology companies, and there is tending to be an overpromise. I mean, I think, you know, if you were looking look at Gartner's hype cycle, I, if we're not near the hype, the top of the hype of blockchain, we're pretty darn close to the thing. I hear people, I'm from the food industry. And I'm going to give you one example of food, and then I'll, I'll give you many more examples in, in the presentation in, in September. But blockchain and food, you know, and I hear people talking about, well, blockchain will increase food safety. Here is the reality of food safety and blockchain. This was the spinach crisis in 2006, which really spurred all of these changes we have with the Food Safety Modernization Act, uh, with people tracking and tracing perishables, the industry that I'm in, right? August 1st, we had the first illness. October 6th, we kind of figured out what was going on, okay? September 17th, we ground to a halt. So between August 1st and September 17th, which is about six weeks, People were eating spinach. The result in 183 people getting infected, three people dying during that period of time. The thing is, spinach has about a 20-day shelf life. It was impossible for blockchain to do anything here to improve food safety. What blockchain will do you, if you had information on blockchain, you could probably go back and see what was the root cause uh, and, and, and what were the chain of events. That's what it will do. But what it's not going to do, and in every case, what I've shown you here is the typical how, how long it takes CDC because first person sick, that means nothing. Five people are sick in an area. Somebody reports it. You start to identify a cluster. Does that mean a, if there's a process that goes along before you even know, and you'll see the graph on the bottom right-hand side, which shows you when the cases peak. Well, by the time the cases peak and you start to do the research, it's too late. So I want to make sure, as we understand about blockchain, to me, what blockchain is about, it's about data that you need to trust, data that you can share, and data that needs to be immutable. And so that's what, you know, these two examples I highlight, they're trying to highlight the complexity of blockchain that we're going to have in the supply chain. It is not all you know, uh, uh, sunshine and rainbows here uh, for this technology. There's a lot of work that needs to be done. So if I go to, you know, I, I call it when reality and technology don't align. You know, I was, this was uh, during the last romaine lettuce scare, which was, I think, around Labor Day. I'm standing in a sub shop. Guy says to the guy behind the counter, hey, does your lettuce come from Yuma? I says, no. He says, uh, uh, our, our, our lettuce come from Cisco. 
you're dealing with people that are at the uh, you know the, the low end of the economic scale. You know, child gets sick from eating cantaloupe. Question is, if you're a mom with a cantaloupe in your refrigerator, do you care what farmer lot that came from? No, you're not going to eat cantaloupe. Or, as a retailer once told me, are you going to really do a selective recall and trust a 19-year-old stocking clerk to only take certain items off the shelf because the blockchain said they were bad? No, you're going to throw everything away because nobody is going to eat anything. And so what I just mean to highlight here is we need to have a dose of reality as we look at where we use this technology. And we need to be, we need to pass the threshold of do we need to trust this data? Is it immutable? Is it shareable information? And if it is, that's the information we need to start considering. And if we can collect it accurately. So I'm just, you know, I, I, I'll highlight one example here and, and then I'll take questions and then I'll show you a couple pictures of some of the things we're talking about. But here's a great example of where blockchain applies. These are vaccines, right? Vaccines that go around the world. Vaccine is, they're one of the most counterfeited products out there. It's cut, it's, it's, uh, it's diluted for people to make money in these third world countries. So blockchain is being used to track vaccines. And, if the, and, and, it, and it's giving us a trust that the vaccine that gets there was not tampered with, the data was accurate, the temperature was accurate, all the things that went along with that shipment were accurate. You know, as we, as we get ready for the, the conference, I'll start talking, I'll, I'll have some examples of where blockchain is used in the fish industry, I'll have examples of where farmers around the world are using blockchain, and we'll give some specific examples, provide some specific case study information. Um, but but anyway, hopefully that was meant to be a good inter, uh, a good practical introduction that's geared towards supply chain people and engineers and not just a broad marketing discussion around how are you going to use blockchain in your supply chain over the next 10 years. So I think now we're open for questions. Excellent, uh, Eric. Thank you. Great, great content and really looking forward to, to continuing the discussion uh, at, at the conference. Um, let start with just a couple questions here. Um, as you mentioned, this this notion with the, the image of UNICEF and, and vaccine management, does, do you see blockchain solving or helping to solve this whole notion of track and trace, or how, how does that fit into to solving that challenge? That's a good question, because everybody's talking about blockchain solving track and trace. Uh, and, and here's what I think it is. So, you know, Track and trace is only as good as the data you put in it. Blockchain is one portion of that. But the other portion of that is IoT technology along the way that's going to be doing the recording of all of that information that needs to go through there. And then the, the thing about track and trace with blockchain and IoT is what it's going to do is it's going to enhance the tracking and tracing eventually. Because I, I can use a database to do track and trace. But what I can't do with a database is, is, is do track and trace and then also add other pieces of data along the way, like temperature uh, or other things that I want to record in my industry, in the food industry, pesticide, water content, damage, spoilage, the, uh, data that adds an enrichment to track and trace that I can't do in traditional methods or I can't do in a database. So I think in that context, John, I think blockchain and IoT together, what they will do is not only solve and, and track and trace, but what they'll do is they'll provide a very enhanced picture of what the track and trace is. Great. Um, next next notion. Uh, it, it obviously will take many, many years for, for blockchain to fully seep into the economic and, and social infrastructure. Um, there aren't you know, so many enterprises implementing blockchain technology today, but obviously it's on the radar. Do, do you have a sense of the timing of, of when it becomes this, you know, widespread, massive adoption? You know, that's a that's a very difficult question to answer because of, uh, I think, a couple of things. <clears throat> you know, <clears throat> in the United States, blockchain projects are driven by ROI. Well, they're, they're driven by ROI and, and, and large corporations have a certain amount of money they're spending to try to do test new technologies. In other parts of the world, like China and India, they're doing blockchain as a matter of, of just they've got to do it to create trust in their supply chains. Nobody believe, In my industry, nobody believes food is safe in China or India. And so the governments in those countries and the governments around the world are looking at how do we use this technology to solve a fundamental supply chain problem we have in our country. And the other problem is they have tax collection in countries like that. In the U.S., we trust our food is safe. 
we trust on tax collection that's going to get done. So in our case, we're looking at ways to use blockchain to improve the efficiency as opposed to the trust. And, and that's a little bit harder uh, to do than the basic issue of, I don't trust the data, so we need some new solution. Well, blockchain's a, a leapfrog technology that does that. But I, I think what we'll find out is, we'll find out that as the, uh, um, you know, as people develop successful use cases, other com companies will embrace those things. And what we'll see is we'll see blockchain adoption. But it's going to, I take a global view, it's going to adopt differently around the world based on conditions in different countries around the world. Right. You know, one of, one of the, the first things that, that I recall in, in hearing a, a conversation on blockchain was that, you know, that blockchain could replace financial institutions. And, and and, and I don't see that happening, but I'm curious to get your take on, you know, how do how does the financial sector say relevant? How, do they value add or, or how, do, how do they continue to have a, a, a role of prominence in the transaction process? Well, I, I think the first thing they're doing, that's a great question, because the first thing they're doing is they're they're trying to talk down the technology. Right. I mean, Jamie Dimon will talk about how Bitcoin is a fraud and none of this stuff will ever occur. In the meantime, banks like Chase and others are, are in the background working as fast as they can to come up with their own type of blockchain solutions. Because what they want to do is they want to, you know, the, the financial transaction still needs regulatory trust and it needs to be controlled. Uh, and governments around the world, I mean, the, the, you know, the central, the, the strength of a government is the power of your currency. And so governments want to control their currencies. And so, I, you know, People will talk about the disruption that's going to occur, but what you run into are two of the biggest impediments in the world, which are governments and financial institutions, which are going to eventually co-opt the technology. And blockchain will be an important part of what J.P. Morgan, Bank of America, and others do, important part of how countries around the world do tax collection. Countries are using it now for bond issuances and stuff. Um, but what they're going to do is co-opt the technology, so we're not going to see a world of uh, Bitcoin or Ethereum out there, and that, that's our wallet. Um, because at the end of the day, currency is backed by one thing, and that's the trust that the, the person that issued that currency is going to actually give value to that currency. Right. Because right. I, thought, and, I just sounded like Warren Buffett. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, it reminded me of, uh, you know, when when the, the cloud first started being relevant, there were a lot of technology firms that dismissed the cloud. and. And guess mm -hmm. what? Those are the folks today that are the biggest champions, right? So uh, it's it's how do you adapt to to new technology and and build it into to your portfolio? Um, just just one last question, Eric. So I, again, great great content here. You know, as as we look to to the September conference and your session, uh, can you give me a sense of who benefits the most from from data being in blockchain across the food supply chain? So really hitting back to to your core um, space. Yeah. So I think at the end of the day, one of the, the, the biggest benefactors is, is going to be the retailer at the end. And the winner is going to be the consumer. The one thing about the perishable food industry, which is different from every other industry out there, is the consumer wants to know everything about that product. The consumer wants to know that the product is safe. You know, they, they want to know that uh, it's fresh. And they want to know all this information. So in the perishable supply chain, over time, to be successful, we're going to be required to share more and more information with the consumer. Now, if I'm going to share information with the consumer, I have to trust that information is accurate, uh, and the consumer wants to trust that it's accurate. And so I, th I think at the end of the day, the retailer is going to be the collection point of all of this data that then they then share because they want to own the consumer uh, to share with the consumer. And the participants in the perishable supply chain, what they're going to have to do is they're going to, have to record information that's around the attributes, the trust of the product, those types of things, and put that in a blockchain so they know that the data that they're recording is accurate and is shareable. But it, and, you know, it just is an interesting way to, to close this. You know, I, I, I spend time in China, and one of the most popular uh, YouTube channels in China are farmers showing what they're picking in the morning to send to market. And there are certain farmers that have thousands, tens of thousands of people that view every morning, here's what the farmer's presenting. People want to know where their food's coming from. And CNBC, they talked about millennials want to know everything about their food. And so for me in this industry, if the retailer is going to maintain the relationship with the consumer, which they want, because it's really retailer strength in perishables and, and less so on brand, 
They will want to have every piece of information they can have to share with that customer, and they need to trust it, which is what the blockchain is going to be used for. Great. Um, excellent. Thank you. Uh, thanks again, Eric. I uh, appreciate your taking the time to be with us today uh, and sharing, uh, you know, very, very unique insights and perspective on this on this highly relevant topic. Uh, and we really look forward to your presentation uh, at ASCM 2019. Uh, to our audience, uh, we hope to see all of you uh, in Las Vegas uh, in September. Uh, don't forget to register by June 30th to save up to $600 on your registration. Please visit ASCMconference.org for more information. This concludes today's webinar. Thanks to all for participating.